Hello and welcome back to the second part of Experiences Connect. Going to start in a couple of seconds with our second session to have a bit of an view on Last Minute Forever, who is the new customer and how will tours and activities be booked in the future. I grabbed my coffee here, so I hope you also used the break to grab your coffee. The second session is going to be hosted by Douglas, CEO and co-founder from Arrival. So very shortly, we're going to start here with hopefully also a fresh coffee in your hand. And there is Douglas. Good morning, Douglas. And with that, I hand it over. This is the second part of Experiences Connect. We now look a bit to the consumer, to the customer. Is it going to be last minute forever? It's going to be moderated by Douglas. And we're joined by Alka from Two Amusement. And I'm Lucas, again, CEO and founder from Booking Kit. It's a pleasure to be with you here today. Hello, Douglas. Hey, Lucas. Hi, Alka. How are you both? Great, thank you. Although I didn't get a chance to get my coffee, so um, but I have water. I'm all prepared. <laughs> we will send you some coffee, hopefully. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Great to be here. Thanks, guys. Great to be here, Douglas. Great talking, seeing you again. Okay, super. Well, sure. let's let's uh, dive right in. So, what I'd like to do today uh, for this session, uh, we're going to do things a little bit, you know, differently. So, I'm not just going to do kind of the typical. Uh, you know, kind of, you know, presentation. Oh, wait, we've got a, we have a, a poll that you want to do first, Lucas? Yes, absolutely. We wanted to know from you. Again, this is a very interactive format, so we want to know from you. There's the chat to the left, and there's also a poll coming up right now. And we wanted to learn from you before we bombard you with our thesis. We bombard you with what we have experienced in our fields. Uh, so we wanted to know from you. Has your customer's behavior reverted back to pre-COVID times? Mm. And you should see the poll right now coming up in the chat. So we'd love to hear that from you to get a bit of a feeling from your side. How is it currently? Is it back to the pre-COVID times or this, this change induced by COVID? Does this stay? We see a uh, high amount of, okay, reverted back to pre-COVID. Uh, we see uh, some customers who say, some operators who say, not there yet. So keep that going. Keep the interaction going. We're going to try to like deep dive a bit into all the different perspectives. If you have questions, use the chat there to the left. And you can also mark them as questions. And then we'll go through those. And with that, back to you, Douglas. Yeah, it's a really interesting question. Of course, you know, also, you could actually probably unpack that and and break that down into uh, many more questions in terms of the different facets of behavior that are kind of some things I think have changed, some things maybe have reverted pretty, you know, pretty quickly. And we can dive into a few of those as we go through the, uh, this, uh, this session uh, today. So I'm actually just going to dive right in. I think we all know who you guys are now. Uh, so we're going to just jump uh, kind of right in here. And what I'd like to do is, so rather than simply just talk through the slides again and present, and then we'll go into a conversation. I want to go kind of slide by slide through some of the findings and talk them through. I mean, I've got kind of my take as, uh, you know, as the researcher and kind of doing, you know, this work and we design the, the research and so forth to get those insights. But I think also to hear from each of you, okay, what are you kind of seeing? How is this playing out in your business? How is this playing out with operators? What does it mean on a practical level? Uh, I think is, is super important. So I'm going to actually present some of the research that I had done in the previous session, as well as a few additional findings as well. But I want to actually kind of slow down a bit and unpack some of those key uh, takeaways as well as we uh, dive into uh, today's experience as traveler and the things that are booking. So the, one of the first things that I showed previously was just the big shift in what travelers uh, were booking. So a bit of a shift away from, or not necessarily, I think, away from some of the classic sites and attractions, but really a shift in kind of how travelers want to experience those uh, those incredible things uh, to see. So I want to take a moment and just ask me kind of both of you, 
what kinds of shifts are you seeing in what travelers are booking or how they're experiencing some of the classic uh, things to do in a destination? So Alka, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, I think this is really interesting, actually. But at the same time, I, I don't necessarily feel that they're mutually exclusive. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of this is so dependent on the kind of holiday that you're, you're going on, the kind of trip you're taking, the amount of time that you'd have in a destination, what kind of traveler you may be. Um, so when, when we look at destinations such, such as, you know, let's just take Rome, for example, you know, having a guided tour just gives you a different type of experience. If I take my my own experience, actually, I recently had a guided tour in a fantastic destination. I took that guided tour because I wanted to be safe. I wanted to see as much as possible. I want to be wanted to be very specific in terms of I wanted to see as well. So I think this is really interesting, but so much is it dependent on what you're expecting to see and do, and also how you want to tailor make your trip as well. If you want something that's more focused around amusement parks or if you're traveling as a family, you know, your agenda is going to be very, very different to somebody who wants to just have a couple of days or have an outdoor adventure style holiday. One thing that we're definitely seeing is that whole surge in outdoor adventure. That's something that's really come out of the all things COVID and, you know, take, for example, boat tours. They are massively accelerating for us um, on across all channels of our business, actually. So I think very, very varied, not mutually exclusive, uh, very dependent on the traveler. Olga, do you, so, you know, one of the things that I, I find, you know, so uh, um, fascinating about the, the TUI business in general is, you know, it's, you know, whereas I think about kind of the classic, you know, kind of OTA market, the online travel agency market, really catering mm-hmm. to that independent kind of self-booking traveler. I'm going to book, you know, I've got mm-hmm. my my flights to the airline website. I'm booking the hotel on kind of booking.com or Expedia or wherever. And then I'm going to, uh, you know, an OTA like, you know, amusement or buy a tour or get your guide to book mm-hmm. the tour, the, the attraction ticket. But in the case of TUI, you know, you've, in addition to the OTA business, you've also got, you know, that kind of classic holiday package, uh, you know, business in a variety of channels, also on kind of the cruise, uh, you know, shore excursion channel as well. Could you give us maybe a little bit of, okay, um, that kind of classic, maybe kind of family, you know, all-inclusive package holiday traveler versus that kind of OTA uh, kind of self-booking traveler, any kind of really big differences or things that operators should be thinking about across those channels or trends that you're seeing there? I think naturally, when you look at all of the various channels that we're involved in, I think it's so much is dependent on that booking flow. You will have a customer who traditionally likes to go to their travel agent, which we do have ample of um, throughout Europe, for example. So they're experience is all about speaking to somebody, being re- reassured about the kind of travel that they want, the type of holiday that they, holiday that they want. Um, and then you have the OTA side where what we have to do is we've got to make sure that from, um, you know, how we're inspiring our guests is is really on point and making things easy to book, making sure that things are, descri- products are described really well. So I think it really does vary. You touched upon intercruises actually, which is really interesting. So with our cruise clients, so what we have is we have clients who come, we'll have um, cruise clients who will approach us to say, this is what the products, these are the products that they're looking for for their clients. We build that all together. And then it's the responsibility of the cruise client in terms of how they are actually going to pitch those products to that client. So to to those customers, sorry. So I think it's really, really dependent on the channel that you go through. I I do feel it's varied. Um, So I hope that answers your question, Douglas, because I think there's just so many parts to it. There's (laughs) There's a real complexity to it. And what we have to make sure, Douglas, is that whoever our customer is, however they are sourcing us, that we are relevant and that we tailor make all of our products in in association with all those various channels. So, yes, what we are finding is very, very, very dependent on where the customer is actually, Mm. where the exposure comes from. 
Just one kind of quick item. There's a question from uh, Menno Beringa uh, about wh what the percentages represent. Just to, to clarify mm -hmm. that, it's a great, you know, great question. Actually, I, I should highlight this because I I'm, I'm swimming in this stuff all the time, so I just take it for granted. So thank you, Menno, for that for that question. So this is basically the percentage of travelers who are doing that particular type of experience. And so, and you'll notice why are the percentages in aggregate so far over 100 percent? But that's because we're asking, OK, the question, uh, what kinds of tours or experiences have you done while traveling over the past year? And so this is across all of the trips they've taken. And typically travelers will do anywhere from kind of five to seven tours or attractions on a particular trip. So this is simply saying, OK, over the past year, uh, 63, 64 percent of U.S. and European travelers in aggregate have done some type of guided tour on some trip in twenty uh, in twenty twenty two. Okay, so Lucas, for you then, kind of what you're seeing across, you know, the booking kit uh, universe, what products are up, what products are down, what are consumers uh, hungry for heading into next year or well this year? Next yeah. Year, Great question. I think always when we talk to operators, they always, uh, Lucas, am I on the winning side? Or am I on the losing side? What's the, the current trend? And what I would uh, like invite us to do, like those numbers, 2019, pre-COVID, 2022, somehow in COVID, today in Germany, we had the removal of the last mask mandates. Yeah? So today is the Freedom Day in Germany. Uh, yet, like when I think about my travel behavior in 2020, like a lot of the large group activities, think amusement parks, felt life threatening. Yeah. I, I was like, I wanted to experience again. I wanted to travel again, but I wanted to go a bit more on private tours. Uh, boats, uh, you mentioned, uh, are the, big winners of 2020, also 2021. I talked to many boat operators who their biggest problem was buying more boats. Yeah, so they were, those were the big winners. So what does that mean? And that's maybe the perspective I want to add when we talk to operators. Does it mean, okay, if I'm running an amusement park, well, <laughs> I'm having a bad year going forward or vice versa. If I'm having a guided tour, uh, it's going to be great. No, I think what we can learn from that is that people had to get re-engaged in activities they maybe didn't have top of mind earlier. So 2020, 2021, 2022 forced us to do more small group experience, more private experiences. We also had it earlier, more VIP experiences. And what we are seeing on Booking Kit is a lot of those learnings on a consumer level are there to stay. If I understood, it's actually a great experience to have a guided tour through the city in a smaller group sit setting. Then this experience, this great experience carries over to my travel behavior also past the restrictions, past this behavior. And so the point of view I would take uh, if I have a historic or cultural site, amusement park, so where the bar goes off, so to say, is what can I learn? How can I adapt my experience to make it more like that? And we've seen great blends of that, so to say. Uh, how can I introduce like more guided products in those kind of historic or cultural sites? How can I work with immersion on uh, audio guides, which is a bit beyond just audio guides, have great experiences with VR and stuff like that. So how can I combine both worlds there? So I would see it a bit less if you're an operator as in which chart am I, but more, okay, what are consumers demanding and how can I incorporate that in my product? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a really great point. I, I think when I look at that shift for guided tours, it's the takeaway for, you know, an attraction or activity is how can I maybe offer something that's uh, a little bit more custom or kind of, or can, some type of private experience if I'm an attraction, right? If I can add something like that, if, or as an attraction or experience, if I can work with more local operators to incorporate my, uh, you know, my experience in uh, their tours of the city as well. So thinking about tour operators, even day tour operators as a distribution channel, not necessarily just as a competitor, <laughs> right, but as a really a partner uh, in market as well. Also, um, I think, you know, Lucas, it was a great segue too. you brought up kind of the shifts in, in group sizes, which we've seen is really extraordinary. So this is kind of the distribution of 
group sizes that we've seen in our research pre-pandemic, so 2019. And this, from work we've done, it was pretty consistent, right? Where generally speaking, we saw it was the larger group sizes that tended to be much more prevalent. And that's just simply because of, you know, availability and price, right? So that's what travelers were doing. Well, in 2022, I mean, it was just, I can just tell you too, like, I, you know, having, you know, been uh, you know, involved in research, you know, in general for, you know, for a couple of decades now. And I've just, I've never seen, I mean, statistically shifts like this over such a short period of three years, just from a researcher's perspective are, it's not just unusual. It's, I mean, it's insane. Like, it's just crazy. Uh, so there's a really profound, I mean, this is I, my view in 2022. This is like a, a kind of a post kind of a COVID convulsion year where we're coming out of the craziness of the of the lockdowns. And we just wanted to be in small groups. We wanted to be with the people that are most important to us. Uh, the shifts were really profound here. So to me, you know, a really important question for you both. I'll, I'll start with you. Uh, so one, have you seen this shift to agree? I sense you already have. But then how much of this is like just simply a COVID convulsion and how much of this is going to endure as we go through the 2023 season and look, you know, a little bit more strategically, you know, beyond uh, longer term? I think there's a lot that we've learned from COVID, actually. And this this was was absolutely no surprise. Um, I do think it is here to stay. I think it's also down to the kind of experiences that people want, um, not always necessarily down to unique, but how to kind of best enjoy an experience and doing that in a smaller group. Obviously, sometimes smaller groups and private tours are going to increase in price naturally. We did some research whereby we actually found that it was no longer the one size fits all approach. Um, at the end of the day, we do have to cater for the private groups, the smaller groups, and that's actually driven our most recent strategy when I think about all things to recollection, you know, being, you know, largest aggregator of prod products for tools, activities, transportation, you know, all of this has to be considered. So our strategy is about focusing on those guided smaller groups, ensuring that you're doing that combination of the slide that you showed earlier, you know, tying in historical sites, tying in um, hidden gems, gems of a destination, but also um, allowing customers to be able to kind of tell us what they want to see whilst they're on a tour too. You might want some elements of a street art tour, food tour. So we've got to bring those elements together. I think what's really important for us all to do is always be able to react. And I think that's why we are doing so on our side. Our research um, clearly demonstrates this too. Um, so, so yes, and again, also down to the type of activity you actually want to do um, and price being a huge factor too. And yeah, Lucas, what about you? Uh, the shift to small group and, and private experiences, this is how much of this is uh, just a COVID uh, reaction and how much is going to endure? No, we we'll see it happen. And I uh, recently I was browsing through my vacation photos 2020 uh, to in 2019. I saw myself in this huge group. I think it was at least your large category, maybe 25 people, which yeah. was completely normal. And a couple of weeks back, I took a dungeon experience with 10 other people and it felt like a super large group. So this is how it played with my mind. And this is perfectly in line with what we are seeing currently and what is here to stay. Because what we see is two key things I would consider as an operator. First, people are willing to pay for that private experience. I think the key challenge is pre or 2019 and before people said, yeah, okay, is it really worth that much to have that private experience? So they said, okay, for a couple of bucks less, I'll just do the small mid-sized tour. But the willingness to pay for private tours was there, but pretty limited. Now being forced to maybe reconsider our behavior more and more have been forced to just say, I will try it out on a private level. And this is something which is here to stay. So this is the first thing, willingness to pay. And the other one, the second thing is always keep in mind as an operator that rich households travel five times more often than poor households do. And this means when you 
produce your products, when you think about your products, you should keep in mind, can I create some VIP version, some private version out of this product, which aligns greatly what we discussed earlier in the first session, uh, where Douglas said, do create those VIP products because there is willingness to pay. And what dramatically changed this willingness to pay is not only on the super rich households, but also more and more on the mid households. So it's definitely something we are seeing to stay. Yeah. One, uh, so kind of one area where I say a nuance that I just want to highlight that I think is important, especially for that large group size. Then we think about large groups. Uh, there are there are two segments here. So one is that uh, uh, kind of scheduled, um, uh, uh, but kind of FIT traveler large group. So if you say you do a large kind of bus tour and you're selling the seats individually through, say, an online travel agency or direct sales. I think it's that segment of the large group kind of tour market, which we've seen really uh, pull back. And of course, another segment of the group market is that kind of pre-organized custom group market. So I'm thinking about, uh, you know, it could be incentive travel. It could be uh, or affinity groups like, say, travel with, a, say, with a church or with a school. And that is a segment of travel that we see actually coming back you know, very strongly. I mean, I myself, for the first time in three years, booked a school trip for one of my kids. And I see that happening you know, quite a bit more. So it's also important to think about which of those large group markets are you focused on. But I'm definitely much more positive on that, uh, uh, on that pre-organized kind of custom that custom group market, we do see that coming back kind of furiously heading into uh, 2023 and and beyond. But for those larger uh, kind of independent traveler tour groups, I think that's could be a challenged sector, at least over the next year or two. And really, if you do a lot offer those tours, really think about how you want to approach uh, the market and maybe think about stepping into that custom group market or looking at offer smaller group or more upscale kind of private uh, experiences uh, as well. Okay, so now I'd like to dig into uh, path to purchase, which really covers you know how travelers find experiences, um, how they make that decision of what to book and how they're going to book it. And I've touched a little bit about this with the discovery and and research and and just kind of finding experiences. Uh, so this is that that slide where I basically I said, OK, guys, you know, marketing and finding consumers isn't going to get easier. Right. It's only going to get harder <laughs> and more channels uh, to, you know, to contend with. Um, I'd like to maybe just so Alka, you know, as a you know, you've got kind of a trade business, obviously a big trade business. You've got also a big direct, you know, consumer business as you just think about, you know, we're travelers start how they find things as you kind of look at this and the fact that travelers are really you know my takeaway here is you know travelers are looking for experiences and input and how they spend their time on trips across a whole range of sources friends and family online you know offline all of this is really important a lot of it too depends on the experience right some things are going to plan in advance some things are going to be pretty last minute kind of as you think about just how you're planning your your strategy for marketing uh, for planting that seed with consumers what channels are you leaning into uh, what channels are you focused on you know this year or is it from a two amusement perspective <laughs> are you kind of having to be everywhere you know all the time you know to just constantly be front of mind for consumers it's everything. Yeah. literally everything and again going back to the fact that we have you know there's the the complexities of having so many different types of customers across various channels you know when you look at the the friends and family piece for example you know you have so many customers would want that validation to know that they are you know having holidays having time away is just so valuable for people and so when they're spending their money they just want to ensure that they're having a fantastic experience i mean for us Obviously, 
um, when actually when you look at friends and family, it's really interesting from the sun and beach side of things that we do. So when I mentioned sun and beach and talking about our holiday packages, mm. but you know, we can have different generations who are going on the same trip, your grandfather, you know, your grandparents, grandchildren, all on the same trip. And you know, TUI tends to have um, quite a legacy of of loyal customers. And so that goes out throughout the family. Google, we're always going to be adapting and pivoting um, what's needed from the B2C side. Social media is incredibly interesting right now. And I know we're going to be touching upon this a little bit later, but it's about really inspiring. And that doesn't change. We have to be relevant. We have to be on top of that. Print media is really interesting, Douglas, because you know we've got to think about sustainability. So as much as we do do this in our destinations, we also want to be pulling back from that and actually doing different types of media. So that's actually, you know, com- uh, you know, something that we want to do from a company-wide perspective. And reviews, you know, as much as, um, you know, reviews are really, really important. But what we're also, what I'm also finding as a, as a traveler, if I'm coming across a negative review, I'm going to be reading that negative review and working out, well, actually, is that reviewer reasonable? So actually, the way people think about reviews is very different. And we're going to be doing a lot more with this, too. Mm. Um, and as for the rest, I want to ask you, that, so you, you mentioned social media. So let me just, I yes. want to dive into that in particular, because I want to, I actually want to ask you, okay, so, Go on. so, so we're, so one, so number one, yeah. why, why am I not seeing more video on, on OTAs? Like when, and, and mm. really, I could t- because to me, when I think about, you know, my own experience as a, just a consumer, and yes, I'm on TikTok and I'm, I, I feel like I have to, right? So, and I, I try to avoid the stupid dancing videos and, <laughs> right? So I, I try to have some self-moderation, right? Some self-control. I know it's hard. I'm right? proud of you, Douglas. I'm proud of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wish my wife could say the same. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think for all of you, I'd encourage you, if you're not on these platforms, to just begin an experiment as a consumer, just as a starting place. But I guess, you know, for me, um, one is I'm I'm kind of surprised we're in 2023 and I don't I really don't see video on the major online platforms for experiences with a little bit of the exception of Airbnb and I'd like to know what's going on and then also number two I would love to know uh, you get a little bit of insight into your thinking on okay when you see a rising channel like TikTok or Instagram Reels for example but there's still the it's those those channels are not as sophisticated yet in terms of uh, measuring you know performance, kind of an ad spend. I mean, it, they're still not as sophisticated as like you know a Google or even kind of Facebook and display advertising networks. So, but we see the organic growth is really powerful. How do you how do you gauge? Okay, when do I when do I start shifting some of the ad spend, you know, budget and how do I track it? Like, how do you kind of think through that process? So two questions, OTAs behind the times on video or just, you know, what's going on there? And then how do you manage kind of your, you know, your approach to marketing and as these emerging channels pop onto the scene, but uh, the tracking kind of on measuring of ad spend still isn't as sophisticated. Me first? Yes, please. Okay, yeah. sorry. Um, so I think from the OTA standpoint, Douglas, I think you're absolutely right. We need to be doing a lot more video or video full stop. I think we are in an age where people want to be inspired. They want quick, snappy videos. Um, and and it's something that we as an industry need to do more of. Um, I don't know about the tech capabilities. I don't know whether that's the reason why we haven't gone down that path just yet. But from our side is something that we are looking into. But we also um, got, have got to be careful not to rush into it as well. And I, that's the kind of advice I would have for um, operators in general. Um, what was the second half of your question, Douglas? <laughs> how do you, yeah, so from a... How do we build this in, in terms well, of how will we build it into our marketing? You know, yes. Well, how do you, so I think this, the, the big question, I think for everybody around, whenever you have a, a new and emerging channel mm-hmm. where they're generating a lot of consumer engagement and interest, but then, but then the question is, okay, well, is it, but is it really generating conversion? When do I, when do I start shifting ad spend? Like, how should I, 
Absolutely. Like I, right. Like, how do I really think about this in terms of my own like marketing tactics? Right. What are the signals I should be looking at? Okay, it's time for me to take 10 bucks from keywords and, you know, put it into Instagram or something like that. I think it's definitely looking at all in a rather holistic manner. I mean, personally, when I look at TikTok, look, and Douglas, I'm on TikTok and my, my husband's not proud of his wife being on TikTok, but at the end of the day, I'm being inspired. So I think what's really important is that you really think about who is the who is the who is my target market? What do I actually want to get out of this? Am I inspiring? Conversions are huge on TikTok. And I think it's really important that we should all be taking advantage of that in terms of a channel. So so for me, I think it's very much about ensuring that we are spending money on these social channels. We have we have to ensure that we know what the target market is. Also, the age demographics is, is so important too. So what I would say is absolutely consider it. But just be wise and sure whatever dollars you're taking from one one channel, moving it to the other. I think it's very important to test and learn as well. And so, look, I yesterday I was I was about out of bed in London. I did have a day off. It was my birthday. I all I wanted to do yesterday was go to one particular bakery that had the best cream buns, which I had seen on TikTok about 50 times a day before. And do you know what? I went. It didn't, didn't disappoint. I had a lovely unique experience, experience, domestic experience here in London. And then I built the rest of my itinerary for the day based on other things that I had seen as well. Um, I might not be your target market, but I could be. I'm waiting to be inspired. So that, that would be my take. So to spend the money, spend it wisely. Got it. No, super. And uh, happy birthday, by the way. I didn't know. It was Thank you very much. Happy birthday. <laughs> <We're late. laughs> so, uh, so Lucas, then, because tell me, am I am I uh, making too much of TikTok? No, I think I would encourage you. So what I did is a couple of weeks back, I was with my girlfriend in uh, some tier two city of the world. And we had a day free. So I'm from the industry. So I have every OTA app on my phone. And we went through every OTA app, checked the city, and then we entered the city name on TikTok. And I was amazed what high quality inspirational content mm -hmm. people produced for this tier two city somewhere in the midst of nowhere. And this is not London. This is not Berlin. This is not Atlanta. This is not like the large cities, but mm -hmm. having this large amount of uh, like content in there. So I think if you have the one thing you do right now is type your city name on TikTok after the session and try it out because I truly was amazed. And a lot of people I talk to, they're still in the inspiration that there's only Douglas and me dancing. Uh, but there's actually yeah. a lot of great content on TikTok, especially for this inspirational phase. Yeah. And the second thing, I just got remembered of a conversation I had very recently with a large boat tour operator. And he was telling me, well, Lucas, I have enough bookings. I'm more looking to change the demographics of my customers. So what I would also invite you to is a bit less with the focus, okay, I want more bookings in general, but think a bit, what is my product like and what kind of pro uh, customers does this product really make sense for? Because if you manage to identify this unique position, in the end, you can also play a bit more around with prices. You can like have a different, a real differentiated position in that market. And what this company figured out is actually they want to address more and more younger people, change their products for that, and for that also change their marketing mix. So those are the two things I really want you to maybe consider based on this data. The one is just try it out, search for your city on TikTok right after the session. And second, think a bit beyond just, okay, I want more bookings. What kind of visitors do I really want to have on my product? Uh, yeah. There is, sorry, oh, sorry Dennis, there is one little bit of advice as I would, I would like to offer though. So, so for example, um, again, I'm going to give you another one of my own experiences. So last year, um, didn't really have as much time off as I would have liked. It was a busy time and there was a short window that my husband and I could go, go. So we went to the coast, we went to Cornwall in the UK. Lovely. We had seen a video of an idyllic spot, which was really quite lovely, rural, etc. We got there, we happened to be there on a very popular weekend and basically what seemed like lovely and idyllic 
basically I went to the window and I could just see people making their pack lunches and you know having a lovely lovely jolly old time but it wasn't as remote as I was expecting um also so I think what's really important is to also manage the expectations. So you can have the best filters and the you know a, a great influencer who's you know uh, you know on, you know seeing turquoise waters and all sorts. I get that, but I think what's really important is what you are portraying to your potential customer is the experience that they're getting. Because my expectation was up here, what I got was down here, but my, I was influenced by what I saw on video because that particular provider had spent that money to have that portrayal. So I think what's really important, also at a time when, you know, hospitality tools and activities, you know, resources can be tight. I think it's really important that we have that balance of great experiences, but making sure that they are real experiences. And I would say, hashtag no filter, remove the filter. Yeah, one point too. I just want to highlight uh, something interesting, and in, you know what you had said, Alka, about so your your birthday experience yesterday, where you went to the bakery for the cream buns that you had seen on uh, TikTok. You know, social on TikTok yeah. and social media. So in a way, it's also like that's you've basically inverted the the traditional booking funnel. So I think what we've all learned over the past ten years, or it's been ingrained in us, is okay, Google you know, maybe an OTA or a website, we look at a bunch of sites, then we make our decision and we do our booking. Mm -hmm. And now it's actually, it's discovery, direct, I'm gonna go. And so there's a real shift there. And I see it, you know, I, I see it too in, in a, a range of things. And even how kind of I see like my kids and younger people, when they make a decision about something that they want or they're going to buy, I mean, I can tell you, right, like my 17 year old is not going to 38 different websites to decide what pair of sneakers to buy. Yeah. He's, he's, he's a friend that's wearing something or he's he's seeing something on Instagram or wherever and he's making that decision. And it's like direct, you know, direct to the experience. It's that's the thing that I want. It's not this traditional funnel. So there's a real potential for disruption that I think can happen. And I think experiences in particular, it's different from the rest of travel because say with flights and hotels, for example, it's frankly, it's a commodity, you know, product, right? Where there are certain criteria and a seat is a seat on a plane, especially for a leisure traveler. But that experience is fundamentally different. What am I going to do? How am I going to spend my time with my wife, with my partner, with my friends, with my family? And just the factors on that decision are are so uh, so important, um, different from that. That absolutely, <laughs> it's how you plan your day, isn't it? In terms of, so I I went to that one bakery, but then what I did for the rest of the day, that it it happened from the point of the bakery. I didn't go to the other side of London. I did, you know, wanted to go to the British Museum, which was two minutes walk away. So, absolutely, couldn't agree with you more, Douglas. Sorry, I interrupted you. Mm. And I think you are already seeing it in the product itself because you you asked questions why why aren't OTAs using more videos and mm. I think it's all interlinked. What you're seeing already on the Chinese version of TikTok is that you can add points of interest and they mm. link out to ticket selling pages already today in the Chinese version. In the Western version, what you have is only the uh, point of interest version, uh, so that the point of interest is uh, like tagged to the video, but at mm. some point point potentially also this is going to come to uh, Europe and to the US so you can see everything is very interlinked and like trying to remove the frictions from all those inspiration to booking process where maybe we more traditional touristic people we were very, very educated on okay first comes inspiration then comes research then comes buying decision yeah. uh, mm -hmm. maybe that's not the model of 2023 anymore mm -hmm. So, so I'm, I'm observing already something that's happening is we're already sp we're, we're spending too much time on TikTok, <laughs> so, <laughs> which is okay. So no, but that's fine. It's my fault too. It's what happens, right? You open the app and suddenly 20 minutes go by. What just happened? Okay, uh, really quick, we have a question from Wolfgang uh, Auwinger. He just wants to know, hey, what about LinkedIn, right? That's like the social media platform that we tend not to talk about actually, but actually from a work perspective. We're in there uh, quite a bit, uh, you know, Lucas or Alka, any kind of quick perspectives from a marketing standpoint or how should operators be thinking about LinkedIn as a as a, a social platform? Lucas, maybe you. 
Start with you. I start of uh, top of mind, we've seen some examples where operators make it work, but I've not seen it really picking up successfully in a marketing mix because typically it's more B2B driven experiences. So for those kind of niche segments we have on board, sometimes it works, but on a broader spectrum, I, I, I would go with TikTok first. Hmm? Yeah, oh. I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more actually. So um, yeah, pretty much yeah. the same. Yeah, no, I, I would. The one point I would I would add there is I, I do know some examples of some operators that are focused on kind of building uh, custom corporate uh, kind of group business. Uh, so if you if you offer experiences that include kind of team building and you do marketing into, say, HR departments or corporations where you uh, offer, say, food tours or other experiences that have a team building component for corporations, LinkedIn could be a potential a channel to build, you know, connections within organizations. But I think from a B2C perspective, we've seen uh, not so much. Oh, and here's another interesting question. Is YouTube dead? <laughs> uh, no, it's still number one in terms of video. And I can assure you of that uh, for teenagers as well. Um, but it's just that TikTok and Instagram have, have surged. But no, definitely not. Uh, okay, now we're, we're, we're getting a Okay. <laughs> But Pinterest, anyone quickly, Pinterest guys, Alka and, and Lucas? Um, well, one quick thing I was going to say about LinkedIn really quickly is yeah. how I think we as an industry should be kind of posting more about the experiences that we're enjoying. You know, we, you know, some of us do have that opportunity to travel. So I think we should be doing more of that. Um, from a Pinterest point of view, not something that we're doing or focusing on. Um, personally, again, I'm, I'm, I'm all about the, the other social media channels, um, but that's just a personal view. Um, mm. Lucas, are you kind of king TikTok right now, right? Yeah, on the other hand, I think like on a global level, Pinterest mm. is where in the, the Snapchat or below uh, bar. Mm. So on that chart, it wouldn't make it and oh. it did not make it. On the other hand, you have three people here who won millions of bookings and analyzed those. Yeah. Your perspective might mm. be a lot different. If you are having food tours, and mm. your food tour has maybe 10,000 bookings per year. This might be your best channel because I know that from your target group, a lot of people are actually on Pinterest. So what we know for operators, that a lot of operators really were able to establish their niche on such marketing channels because it's a bit off the beaten tracks. And Douglas will not tell you, go to Pinterest. But for your product, it might be the best choice ever. So don't uh, always treat this a bit with a pre, how do you call it, with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your strategy? Absolutely. What's not on a global level? It wouldn't make the chart for us as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Capture yeah. an audience. Yeah, super. Uh, okay, so let's let's jump ahead here. I know we are we only have just uh, about five or six minutes left. Okay, so the path to purchase and 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 booking so i just wanted to highlight here we talked about this in the previous session about the really big shift in channels kind of the surge in you know kind of mobile uh now basically on par with or overtaking you know desktop and a real drop off in some of the offline channels you know walking up to a ticket office or calling or going through a hotel uh concierge or you know or travel agent would just love to get kind of the perspective from both of you on what you're you know, seeing. We heard from you, Lucas, uh, earlier how um, OTAs and resellers really surged during the pandemic. Uh, Alka, you've got a view across a whole range uh, of channels through the TUI organization. Uh, you know, is this reflecting you know, what you're seeing? What are some of the big shifts that you're observing in how travelers are booking things to do? I think all of these elements are just ever so important. And as you say, we cover the majority of them too. If I think about um, our app, for example, I'd say about 75% of our TUI customers are actually downloading that app. And if I think about numbers, that's about 15 million downloads, which is huge. So I think, again, it's about people being being mobile, be, you know, being able to just, just book then and there. So from, I would say we're very much in line, in line with this. And, and also from our side of things, you know, we do have agencies, we do have our agent platform whereby bookings can be made even via us through those, through those methods too. Um, so I think all of these that we cover, um, so, so no, no surprises from our side in that respect. Uh, Lucas on your end. We see it dramatically different. Where? Forget desktop. What wow. we are 
booking right. it's two thirds of all bookings happening on mobile devices a minority of that tablets but if you focus on phones and i see in a couple of weeks, we're going to have sessions at Arrival optimizing website conversion. Mm -hmm. And then typically operators open their laptop and show the website. Yeah. And the first thing we do is we close that laptop and say, forget the laptop. Let's take out the phone. Two thirds of your customers you want to reach are booking over the phone. And what we are seeing across our users in European uh, countries and worldwide like consumers, that it's far more dramatic than shown here. Two thirds of all our bookings are coming from mobile. If you think, if you don't think your product mobile first, which relates mm -hmm. to a lot of how the entire flow works, then you can think about desktop. But first you think about mobile and all those devices. So this is dramatic difference we are seeing. Please, dear operators, forget desktop, choose mobile. Yeah, I, that's such a great point. And something we also say too, like if when you're, you know, when you're working on, on website changes or looking at, you know, updating uh, your, your site in some way and you're doing, you're asking your team to do tests, you know, phone first, like just think phone first, phone first, phone first, and then everything else, <laughs> desktop and everything else, you know, second, because that's where your consumers, your customers are going to be finding you first. So that's great, great guidance. And actually, you know what, I appreciate that too. And I'm going to mention that to um, all of our yeah, because we do have we have our website slam session at Arrival in Berlin in a month where we bring a lot of digital experts together and you can sign up and have an appointment and to have your website reviewed. I'm going to yeah, share that with all of our marketing experts who are doing we're leading those those private consultations and tell them to yeah close the laptop and bring, you know, bring the phone. That's fantastic. So thank you, Lucas. Some great advice for me. Great. On that. That's a great <laughs> So and also, uh, if you want to think it less intellectual, think about Alka sitting yesterday at the yeah, bakery and exactly. what to do next. She, mm. Do you imagine a world where she pulls out of her pocket the laptop <laughs> and then dials into the Wi-Fi and then figures out what to do next? Obviously not. Yeah, And this is the world we live in. Absolutely. You know, we've, we've got to tie it all in. It's all connected. People are on the go. They, they're also constantly seeing opportunities or things to do, be it, the, be it on public transport, even just walking by something to say, what is that? I want to do this now. But, you know, so much of this is also dependent on the type of traveler, age of the traveler as well. But I'm I'm 100 percent all about mobile, too. All right. Let's. Uh... Uh, charge ahead here. So the booking window. So this is something that we've seen as well, a really, you know, a pretty big shift in here. We're just looking at, you know, at tours, but we've seen this increasing uh, uh, kind of shortening right of the booking window, travelers booking, you know, more and more uh, last minute. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, any, I mean, perspective here, is this just, this is just the, the way of things now? Everything is kind of super close in. I mean, what, what should we all be thinking about when we see trends like this? Alka, for you? So much is dependent on the type of holiday you're doing. I said, mm. you know, really, um, if it's somebody who's planning a heading to theme parks or Orlando from a UK source market, they're going to plan way ahead of time. Yeah. But all, all of this, again, when we were talking about everything being connected, you know, if you are out and about, if you know that you there is no urgency to book certain tools because they're they're available, they're free sale, then then yes, you, you've got that flexibility. And that's what people really want out since, you know, since COVID flexibility and being able to be able to cancel and just in case there's something else to do, that's what people want, which is why there's no surprise that whole piece around the increase in same, same day or just a shorter window is so important. Mm -hmm. um, we're seeing that, we're actually seeing that across various channels. So, um, so yes, so no surprises. I do think it's here to stay. People do want to experience things more instantly. And I think that's really important when it comes to, you know, cut off times with some of the products that you can book to, you know, where where people do just want to do it here and now. People are less patient than they used to be. We need to be aware of that. Yeah, Alka, but the, the point you raised too at the beginning about, so this is like an aggregate, right? This is across all tours and activities, mm. all, all tours, right? So yeah. all all tours and destination, but you, and this is something that we've seen in our research very clearly. There's a, there is an absolute correlation between the perceived importance of an experience to the traveler and when they book that experience in relation mm -hmm. to the trip. So if I'm taking the family to say Disney world or, or on a ski trip and the, 
that the, the amusement park or the skiing is like central to the trip, I'm going to make sure the passes or tickets are set well in advance and everything mm. else falls around it. But then there's that last minute visit to a museum. I've got a few extra hours. OK, fine. We'll just walk right up or I'll book it on the phone. But it could be a couple of hours in advance of the visit. And so for me, also like a key thing for every experience operator is to recognize, OK, you know, where are you in the pecking order of your customers' priorities on their trip? Are you like a tier one, like this is what travelers want to do? Or are you more of a, OK, like a nice add on on the trip and they might be looking for a variety of tours and this one's going to pop? And so when you know kind of where you fit within your customers' hierarchy, that should really help you inform of your marketing but also as well like your pricing too and this ties back into dynamic pricing especially for you know for tours where if you've got a few seats maybe just a few seats left on a kind of a food tour and it's it's about to depart tomorrow potentially an opportunity to even lift your prices there in that last minute especially if you see more kind of demand coming into your destination um, but lucas kind of really quickly uh you know from kind of your point of view on booking window and what operators should be thinking about? Two things. The trend is here to stay. So uh, deal with it and adapt it to your operations. I think we have a lot of operators who still say it's going to go back. My operation doesn't support this. I would urge you to think customer facing first. And sorry, sticking with the example, Alka, she's sitting at a bakery. Your tour is departing in one hour. Just yeah. because you printed the manifest this morning, you can still have her on the tour and earn the extra ticket price. So I think we have to adapt to that new world. And yeah. second of all, what we're also seeing is that within COVID, people expect more flexibility from operators. So obviously it was normal if I have COVID, I can bail out of my ticket. What we are seeing more and more is people just expect to be more flexible on cancellations, even on non-COVID illnesses and stuff like that. It's also something to consider in your pricing, in your uh, general setup to allow that flexibility which customers demand. We, we certainly as a business have to really, you know, we, we've got to step up as well. You know, what, sorry, when I say step up, we need to be very aware of, of this because when it comes to availabilities, to we, for example, you know, we, we run our own products. So we need to make sure that we're ahead of the curve here and that we don't have problems with availability, that we've got lots of staff, um, you know, to help run our activities too. So we're also seen as a supplier. So I think availability is really, really important as well. Okay, so Lucas, let me ask you, do we have time for one more slide or are we just about, are we just about at the end? We can uh, steal a bit of coffee time and then we wrap it up. Okay, okay, so I'm gonna just jump to this one slide, um, and I'm just going to take a moment. So this, this to me, of all of the research that you know we do at Arrival, and there's lots of reports and whatnot, but this to me is uh, perhaps the most important slide. I just want to take a quick minute to just power through this. I normally don't, when I present slides, I normally don't actually go through every single item there, but I just want to highlight this because I think this is so so important where basically we asked travelers when you chose that particular tour activity or experience what were the factors that influenced that decision and i wanted to just highlight here activity description at the top far and away the most important thing if you spend your time on anything it's how you name it how you describe it what are the inclusions to make it really appealing and compelling for your potential guests it is incredibly important the ability to book online it's amazing still in 2023, half of all operators are not using a proper online booking system. Uh, so Lucas, you've still got some work to do, I'm afraid, you and, and all your competitors. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of booking systems out there, but so much opportunity, but it really impacts the market when you know it, it makes it more challenging for consumers to find those experiences and it makes it really hard for organizations like Alka's at Two Amusement to connect and make that that content discoverable and bookable. So that's still, it seems like a basic issue, but it's huge this year. The ability to talk to, to, to someone, uh, this is also incredibly important. We ourselves uh, just did a webinar yesterday on, on chat and how operators can implement a chat within their environment, especially for experiences, consumers, uh, they want, they may have questions for it's such an important decision. Uh, so 
if you can offer some mechanism for your customers to speak to one of your staff to get questions answered, incredibly important. Also, I want to highlight here photos and videos by travelers. So customers rate this as more important than traveler reviews, which is something, you know, we all spend, we have sessions on, and we spend a lot of time on it. We're all worried about it and our ratings and so forth. But photos and videos from other travelers, guests on your experiences are more important than reviews. Travelers want to be able to see themselves in the, uh, in the experience. I'll also just highlight a few things below. Special deals or discounts at the bottom, not that important, right? We talked about this. Travelers, they want the most out of their experience. Price is not as important in 2022 and 2023. COVID safety protocols, nobody cares anymore. Uh, it's just not, so don't worry about it. And then, you know, brands, known brands, it's still not really a factor within this sector, uh, which is, uh, which to me, what the takeaway there is actually, uh, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's like a marketing, it's like guerrilla warfare. Like you don't, you can't rest on the laurels of your brand. You've got to fight for every customer in terms of being in every marketing channel, uh, in terms of your pricing, your offering, your descriptions, your customer service. Like it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, a uh, yeah, it's a brutal <laughs> competitive marketplace out there. Uh, and we really don't have big global brands within tours and experiences. So there's a lot packed in here, but I think this is one of the most important slides of all the work that we've done. I just like a quick, you know, like a takeaway from, from Alka and from Lucas, something that's really important that I've missed here, or uh, maybe something that really jumps out at you that you'd like to highlight. Um, Alka, I'll start with you. Douglas, very quickly, I don't know if anyone can actually see the slide because I can't see it on mine, on my screen. Yeah, it's but up, if it's not... Up. It's on. Okay, it's just me. Okay, I've got another version of it here. That's fine. So um, I think for us, um, actually, no, full stop. I think descriptions hugely important, making the the buying journey really e um, a lot easier is incredibly important, but inspiring and and really kind of having that unique um, storytelling, you know, make someone feel as though this is what you're going to experience. This is how it's going to be. And I think that's really, really important. We support all of our operators through the back of a, a great um, um, supply management team who actually really do help our um, operators and how to ensure that we're kind of delivering the best advice on how to really optimize. So, and I think, um, you know, all things as far as photos, videos, I think you just have to, you know, I was on the supplier side and I also knew that we had to invest good money when it came to photos. So I would say always, always focus on that because that's what's really important. Don't just rely on the photos from your um, from customers, do your own too. And and also, if you have, a, for example, a Segway tour, don't have loads of images of people on a Segway tour. You know, think about how someone's really going to enjoy a destination and everything they're going to see. So bring bring all of that to everything that you do and everything you to put at the forefront. And I'm taking too much time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Luke's very short. Quality is more important than price. And yes. operators dramatically underestimate that. Yeah, there's a lot of focus on price. There should be a lot more focus on providing quality and making that quality transparent and visible. And, and, uh, and Douglas uh, dubbed the charts, the one chart to rule them all. Yeah. I love it. Uh, I, I use it all the time. Uh, take this chart. If you take one chart home, take this chart. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah, thanks, Lucas. We had two uh, questions here. I think we can address them really quickly. One on data on whether travelers prefer OTAs or booking direct. And I'll say really quickly, I think most of the time travelers actually have no idea where they booked, uh, which mm -hmm. means again, it's, it's like, it's a knife fight out there. So you gotta be, you've gotta be everywhere. And then another question, uh, the best way for customers to see photos and videos by travelers. So get your customers, uh, get, get them to get to produce photos, trying to get them to share them with you. And again, have them out everywhere. So you're on OTAs, have them there. You're on TripAdvisor, have them there. On your own websites, have them there. On your social media, have them there. So wherever you're out in front of your customers, that's where you want to have these photos and videos there. So I think we're, we've got a few minutes over, two minutes before the next session. So I'm going to hand things back to you, Lucas. 
Thank you so much, Douglas. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, thank you, Alka, for joining us here today. Thank I think you. Alka now gets her cup of coffee <laughs> and Douglas will bring his kids to school. So uh, thank you very much for joining us. For the next session, you click on a link. It's in the comments. You click on that link. We see you in the next session, which starts in 60 seconds. Thank you so much and see you in a second. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you.